All right, we have a whole new special guest episode. This is the first guest episode that we've done so f ever before. Really? Yeah. That's impressive. It, take, it took us a while to actually get to this point, I guess. But we have a very special guest in Thomas Murphy, who I think his credentials officially are math expert or math whiz, maybe. I'm not sure. I think he's an expert in a lot of different areas, personally. Yeah, you're an expert in accelerationism. You're an expert in Bruno, I would say. And in math, so you got like a multiple threat. Uh, perhaps, yeah. I'm far too British to deign to ever call myself an expert in anything, but... Yeah, I'm interested in the philosophy of mathematics and philosophy of history and their intersections. Certainly. I love it, because we've been trying to get to the bottom of a lot of math stuff, but we have gotten sidetracked on a big exploration of political economy. So I actually wanted to put a show up. Somebody asked us to do a, just a show about like recommendations of how to study political, political economy, like classics of political economy. That was like a week ago, because I went to go edit it. Me and Ed recorded the whole thing. I went to go edit it, and I started having these questions of, okay, well, what about this? What about... I'm not sure about this. So I just started looking into it more, and now it's... I'm up all night just reading uh, biographies of Restoration Admiralty officers and like, trying to figure it out, and Royal Society members. Every time I look at my phone, there's like 500 like screenshots from KB that's like detailing histories of the Royal Society and stuff. And I don't know, now I'm down in this big value theory rabbit hole, you know, reconstructing the entire history of where economic theories of value come from in the first place. Do so you have any, been a do you know, have anything you can tell us about that, T Murph? Because we, we're going back to like Thomas Hobbes, trying to look at him because we're tracing this, this you know labor theory of value or just trying to find out about the objectivity of value and we're tracing it through like william petty and then through james harrington and then you know we're getting to thomas hobbes and we're trying to go beyond yeah. that but because you know, we don't know because yeah aristotle has you know the exchange value and use value distinction but somewhere along the ways, you know, there was this whole idea where those you know exchange value was a representation of some value in a deeper sense and it seems to be Hobbes who really, like, he didn't call it value, but he introduced this idea of, like, uh, land and labor being the first and foremost, like, principles that generate, you know, economic wealth. Yeah, and that's also tied to the natural law tradition, sort of von Grotius and Pufendorf as well. He wants to sort of... Uh, really, it's the, the first applications of physical theory to political theory as well, isn't it? With Thomas Hobbes' work De Corpore on bodies is kind of leading over into the leviathan work isn't it we talked about man being situated in the auricular nerves of the man leviathan yeah that, that's really and, interesting. Um, yeah i guess also with with the value question it's like it starts off with the very basic aristotelian categorical distinction between quantity and quality right and then does yeah, so use value like, and exchange it, value because yeah it seems like we're getting into this whole nexus of corpuscularism of being a big part of it like especially physiological metaphors and corpuscles Definitely. that's the whole thing right there somehow yeah so De decapore is treating of the body as this unit which kind of is is more old school physics natural philosophy isn't it but then by the time the physiocrats are using it it is this image of the body as the whole of society well we're actually i'm finding it's william petty who's doing a lot with that coming up with the idea of the velocity of money and the circulation of credit in the economy and then they're using the explicit metaphor of circulation of blood yeah right? which hobbes i found last night actually introduces this idea as well because he talks about you know kind of like the body politic yeah which it, I, I didn't realize like he did that i i know that like the physiocrats that was really important for them but i didn't realize that hobbes also kind of had like a uh, economic blood flow metaphor complex going mm -hmm. on yeah, he uses uh, circulation in the sense of blood circulation as well, doesn't he? And talks about veins and nerves of of, of the society, yeah. Yeah, well, and then William Petty, is the, that's the thing, is that he had been in France because Thomas Hobbes, he was connected to the royalists during the Civil War. So he was in France and the royal court and all the, the royalists were in France in exile. And William Petty went over there and did dissection things with Thomas Hobbes. You add in all this stuff that the Royal Society, and I'm going through these you know the first papers of the royal society and is about gardening and forestry and just reading these these papers it's just going absolutely crazy looking at this stuff but we'll get that one we're gonna get to the bottom <laughs> of that one <laughs> actually like, i don't know why we get so carried away i do feel like compared to what we had recorded before the answers that we have about this are by comparison very intense yeah it, it 
just started off as like a just a very straightforward recommend a few books but spiraled into you know something else entirely i'm a perfectionist stanley stanley kubrick a show out unless oh <laughs> unironically i mean we we want to do this one though to talk a bit about more about math because you could see the vast vastness the vast scope of our research projects here where we're doing all this stuff about political economy for a couple of weeks and then we in order to do this we have now put our our other project on mathematics on on hold a bit but what we had been talking with you thomas murphy about is uh we really want to get into uh, kind of retracing the debates between john von neumann and norbert weiner about teleology uh and we want to trace that back through david hilbert and then go into this like neo-kantian uh history of mathematics and this guy uh uh leonard nelson right and so that's what we've been trying to also figure out as well and that's that's kind of why we have been we brought you in as the expert about that yeah definitely and just going back to the physiocrat stuff there's probably a thread which i'd have to do more research on about the beginnings of heat theory and um obviously that figures massively into the french revolution but just in terms of again physical theories sort of going into that but yeah, like, so the big thing for Wiener initially, isn't it, is the, is the problem of purpose, because without a good philosophical grounding of purpose, he can't, you know, you can't conceive of something with a system if it doesn't have a boundary condition or an end. And he goes through, I think he compares Leibniz and Bergson, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah he does, he does. Um, in his discussion of, like, vitalism and mechanism, and he says, which I think he's quite right about, that, like, the vitalist mechanist opposition is a kind of non-problem, is an antinomy, so it's like, it's taking it you know either conceiving of an end in itself uh an unqualified end or trying to get rid of any sort of purposivity without which like you know pure mechanism yeah I, you can't, his, you can't his whole systems thinking can work you? on cybernetics the stuff that he actually writes is pretty you know we had talked about this in the last episode it's he's right about a lot of what he says about the ways that he's uh, conceptualizing the approach to systems he kind of recognizes these problems but he doesn't and he recognizes like a uh, pretty straightforward intellectual lineage that's you know running backwards like you know we, we did talk about how like bergson kind of fits into this whole question of like uh entropy and entropy dissipation and like neg entropy and i think that that's like something that wiener's like really picking up on so he is like very cognizant of uh you know the the traditions that he's building upon he just has a weird ambition i guess uh, where he can't stop himself or he doesn't really recognize the consequences of what he's talking about or he doesn't follow it through all the way until later i guess until till god and golem yeah no he doesn't achieve sufficient philosophical grounding but he does gesture towards some of the right thinkers and yeah bergson is certainly thinking about um thermodynamics and applying like calculus to the timelines of individuals like there's a theory of individuation or you know, the singularity of the individual is relating to uh, almost functional analysis in Bergson. So, like, uh, the Bergsonian catastrophe is like this, the saddle point in, in calculus, right? So, um, and, and, and of course, Wiener is, is quite unique in being open to philosophizing about these things amongst mathematicians of that period. I mean, so, but, but you're right, he doesn't achieve sufficient... Um, coherence uh, but the other example of a thinker from that period who is well-grounded philosophically is probably von Bertalanthi you know the early systems theorist oh yeah we he talked about, about him yeah we had talked about him in the yeah. last episode I was reading some of the other I was reading more of his book too um one of his books yesterday and it was actually he's he's very cognizant of the problems as well um and he's yeah, very definitely. critical well, he, of, of he cybernetics. Roots the pro sorry no go ahead go ahead I'm sorry just remind me. He is critical of cybernetics in, uh, because I think he understands the philosoph philosophical problematic we're about to approach, which is he roots the origin of the concept of the system in uh, Nicholas Cusanus or Nicholas von Cusa and his idea of the uh, coincidentia oppositorum, the coincidence of contraries, which is the fact that, um, you know, that this is really getting at the cosmological ideas that, you, you know, there's a kind of paradox in the constitution of the idea of a system as a whole, which is like this, obviously like the conceptus cosmicus in, in Kant. So um, relating it back to the Wiener discussion, like the idea of like a, a total end in itself or, uh, you know, th th this, this sort of teleological snare and the definition of purposivity, like that's captured in that initial sort of paradox at the origin, I think. 
and that's probably why he's critical of Vina. Yeah, it's this whole co- history of the organism. Uh, people it, it can easily take it for granted, even just kind of pointing it out in some conversations with people. Uh, they don't want to delve into this this whole history here. They just want to uh, presume or take it for granted that this concept has a universal applicability, that it's always been around. But really, we, you know, I was able to trace it uh, etymologically into the debates at of the Royal Society, which is uh, part of what I've been looking at. And you can really find it. I guess uh, the first usage of it, it's it's in like John Evelyn and. Uh, some of the members of the Royal Society during the Restoration and in the 1690s. That's when that term comes about, and they start talking about organization, right? And they are originally using organism to mean organized system, and they are not using it in a strictly biological sense to refer to animals or to discrete um, organic entities or necessarily in any kind of biological sense. They're using it more, Definitely. yeah, to talk about. Uh, a system in the exact same way that Viner does. Yeah, it's 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 about the relation of parts to wholes, right? Isn't it? It's carrying on with that old Aristotelian idea, and that's what that old sense of the word organism refers to. It's what is how Kant uses it as well. It's the sense of organon in philosophy, like philosophy conceived as a system. So, yeah, you're right. The introduction is not this naive day to day idea of the biological entity. It's um, it is the, a more philosophical abstract idea of the relation of wholes to parts in general. Yeah, and, then, and that's, I mean, that becomes then, Yeah, uh, it goes right into debates that Leibniz is having, uh, because Leibniz is also a member of the Royal Society, right? Uh, he's, a, he's a foreign member of the Royal Society, but Leibniz yeah. is very connected into the politics of the Glorious Revolution, which is kind of a whole crazy history in of itself, of uh, where Leibniz, he was the librarian for the house of hanover right part of his project was to write the whole history of the house of hanover in order to justify its uh claims to uh its various holdings in northern germany and saxony so he actually through that work he also helped to arrange right the uh ascension of the the king george the first and the hanoverian dynasty to the english throne he kind of provided the historical background, the historical justification for that in his work. And then uh, he had, for that reason, gone to England. He got into London, visited twice, and he demonstrated his, his calculator at the Royal Society. He met Boyle. Uh, so he was very hooked into that, too. So he was having th- those debates at the same, same time with people like Locke and with all of his various opponents and correspondence he's he's using all these organic systems thinking as well in those debates and you know it's it's completely continuous with the royal society and their usage and development of the the concept it's interesting oh, talk- go ahead, Ed, go ahead. Go ahead. You, you, you. oh no i was just gonna say yeah, um no. oh, sorry thinking about like parts and holes and an organism becomes a question of holism and one of the things that i think that we really identified with wiener was that he he has this very strange idea of holism that's based on like analogical reasoning where it's like kind of a you kind of have this abstract uh model that's an analogy you know probably like to a biological organism or something else like that and then you proceed to basically extend the uh analogy or the metaphor basically infinitely and so in that process i think that this earlier question of parts and holes really kind of gets obscured entirely and i think that that's probably at the root of his philosophical error and why it can't be grounded properly i guys yeah exactly because i sent you uh thomas murphy i sent you the uh some pages from the uh boolean logic system the algebra that was being developed by william stanley jevons he has a couple books about it. i sent you some stuff about that and you saw right that he he's conceptualizing boolean algebra entirely as a logic of analogy and then he says that's the key to the whole thing is that it just is an analogical completely yeah and in terms of analogical logic it, it's quite interesting how this relates to the history of uh, rhetoric right and the, the application of logic in in rhetoric and you wouldn't tend to make this connection between the concept of a system and the logical system but obviously this relation of the topic at hand to the overall thrust of the argument is they came up historically with a lot of ways of doing this obviously in kant's cosmological ideas the regressus in infinitum and the regressus in indefinitum is actually it comes from rhetoric doesn't it where you start to make a circular argument yeah, yeah that might be that might be the muddying the fact that it has this potential to be uh, analogous in cross fields and then 
field where it's most useful. Obviously, biolog biology was desperate for a concept of purpose, but without old school teleology. So that could be it. it yeah, it gets it's really wild because this is the thing that I've been looking at for a long time is a lot of those debates about systems theory is that it sounds very reminiscent of what Kant is talking to Herder about, because this is the whole essence of their debate, is that Herder is coming at things from a historical perspective. He wrote a big book called The Ideas for Hist uh, Universal History of Humanity, and that is very teleological in that it has a progressive structure to the history that he's saying humanity to progress. That's the whole thing, is that he wants to have a progressive history of moral improvement and of development of the mind. And so his vitalism, that's what his vitalis vitalistic theory really is, is he's postulating the existence of some kind of super sensible force. And he's, he's saying that mind and matter are the same kind of substance and that they, they differ in terms of degree of organization. So he's collapsing dualism and he's saying that really consciousness is a more highly organized form of matter. And the mechanism through which he's saying that happens is, is the nervous system, because this is at the same time when the nervous system is first being mapped by physiologist named uh, Al Albert von Haller. And ha von Haller is the guy who discovers the principle of nervous irritation and how when irritation of the of a nerve that muscles around it contract. And so Herder's building off this whole idea in order to talk about how matter becomes more highly densified and condensed and, and organized yeah. inside of the human being in, in order to make consciousness where this contraction and densification and interiority where everything is drawn inside and the energy is condensed into consciousness. That's fascinating. It also reminds me of John Brown's theory of asthenia and uh, asthenia, positive and negative excitation, being overstimulated and understimulated. Obviously, it was really big amongst the English romantics and Thomas de Quincey, diagnosis of entertainment culture in London at the period where people go and see all these crazy shows with smoke screens and so on was, was that of being overstimulated. It's obviously very applicable to the modern information environment. But Novalis generalizes this principle and he uses the plus or minus symbols to represent these, these actual base ontological propositions. And they've, they're very reminiscent, I think, of positive and negative feedback in cybernetics, but transcendentally grounded. So the concept of building amongst the Jaina romantics is highly biological, right? It's developed from medicine of the period. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then the thing that Ed blows my mind with is that then, Ed, you brought in my awareness of all this, uh, the the role of physics, right, in the development of economics, and that you, uh, you know, I was sleeping on this guy for so long. I was I was sleeping on Mirowski and and these books. By oh yeah, him. more heat than light. Yeah, and so the, you know we or more light than heat. I can't remember the no, name. No, it's just more it's more heat than light, and. Uh, the more that I read that, I read all the sections about, you know, classical, neoclassical economics and the role of physics in that. But then you, you so you've uh, brought in this whole awareness that I never really thought too much about of like von, uh, of Hel uh, Helmholtz and, and physics in the 19th century. And that's like a lot of the same stuff too, where both economics and biology yeah. uh, are dealing with some of the same problems in terms of the conceptualization of bodies and systems and how it's all based around these same metaphors, right? And Mirowski actually has like this really good quote from uh, more, more Heat Than Light that I saw that I thought summed it up really, really well. It goes back to the problem of the slippage of metaphors again, doesn't it, as well? Because his point is actually that these were over-applied, weren't they, these concepts from physics and, and biology and, and until they became naturalized into these kind of dogmatic images of classical economic thought yeah like that's the core i think of his entire critique yeah. because like in machine dreams it's basically a continuation oh, of definitely the, yeah and, and, and modern econophysics is very uh, liberal in its usage of concepts from physics it doesn't sort of um provide you with why the system under survey warrants the usage of that physical notion <laughs> yeah yeah like what's funny about neoclassical is that they do continue the, the metaphorical slippage but they abstract it away into this very idealized realm. So you really don't necessarily have direct access to the metaphor itself, just the model no. that's descended from the metaphor. Absolutely, yeah. There's a concealed metaphor. Well, let me just read the quote because it's perfect because he's talking about Darwinian evolution. He's talking about bodies and physics and neoclassical economics. And here's, here's what he says. One answer is to notice that the metaphor that synthesizes the research program at each vertex is essentially the same metaphor. Here is the sense in which we are no longer dealing with prosaic notions of intellectual cross-disciplinary influence. Zeitgeist or epistemes 
The research program situated at each vertex derives legitimacy from its radically unjustifiable conservation principles from the homeomorphisms uh, with the structures of explanation at the other vertexes. A uh, legitimation function is central to the success of each research program because the central principle at the heart of each is purely conventional and thus from a disinterested and detached point of view simply false which I, he says that it's completely that's the whole problem right there i think so yeah and this is like the work of like elie ash on the misapplications of probability theory in modern finance where like you know what they were doing made no sense whatsoever they were basically making financial products on the basis of uh, you know mathematics mathematics that didn't work like uh that you know sort of sort <laughs> yeah. of nested uh problematic mathematics where like you have like a you know a probabilistic pricing on upon probabilistic pricing it and it was just nuts there was no you know <laughs> they're acting as though they could genuinely predict the future well what's interesting to me about like his critique is it's very interesting in its basis but i, I listened to a more recent interview and it seems like now he's trying to create models to, to do exactly this, like to find more accurate pricings of futures. But I feel like, I don't know, I don't get it, because I feel like his whole critique of how, like, you know, this probabilistic determination, like, kind of forecloses that in a very absolute sense. Yeah, and, you know, Ed, I also found yesterday reading some stuff in Viner, just more evidence from his two autobiographies that he did is all of his it's like pathological the way that he approaches analogy and you had, you had pointed this out and the stuff that you found what was the book that you found about where he's talking about how he treats mathematical problems as oh, shit. A, a, as Man. physiological because you you sent me a quote a while ago that he was younger he was sick or something he, he went on a big walk or he was at home and he was not feeling well and he became aware of the motion of a fan or something and he somehow connected it in his mind to some mathematical problem he was thinking about and then he yeah i would have to go back and find that it's it's somewhere buried but what, what i think is pr pretty interesting is i think that like bateson actually like um he's kind of hemmed in by the framework you know because he's working from the kind of like wiener perspective but i think he becomes very cognizant of this problem because like he outlines three different models of learning and so, like, learning one is just, like, rote memorization. And then, like, learning two is more of a reflexive process. But learning three is kind of, like, this much higher and more difficult to attain uh, reflexivity where you start to recognize uh, basically, like, what kind of what Robert Anton Wilson would call, like, reality tunnels. <laughs> uh, you know, where it's, like, uh, di di completely differing frame epistemological or ontological frameworks, and you can kind of, like, navigate amongst them. But, like, it it's kind of, like, an obtuse way that he frames it, but the way that I ended up, like, kind of starting to read it after, like, looking at the Wiener analogical problem is that he's? It, it's a way to kind of, like, you know, you're starting from this position where you're kind of stuck in the analogical mode, but the different ways of learning are a scaffolding in order for you to get out of that analogical reasoning. Yeah, uh, uh, okay, there's two things. Um, so one, the Bateson thing does like resemble Kantian faculties, right, doesn't it? Where you have this sort of habituation, insensible input, you have this mediation via the faculty understanding, then you get sort of full reflexivity uh, in, in reason. reason. Oh, that's, that's a really good point, Timo. Bateson does... He is talking about Kant because he used, I think in that same essay, is that the, the repetition form? He talks about the critique of judgment and basically he makes the same point as von Bessel-Anthe about, you know, the system being conceived of as like a world whole. But um, I mean, in general, though, I think that the whole, you know, turning all the philosophy and maths into physiology is quite an interesting thing. And von Neumann himself does say this, like, doesn't he say mathematics is the language of the human nervous system, right? I think that's kind of fascinating. It's it kind of relates to there's a French guy called... Jean Petito, who talks about top, like topological syntax or tries to topologize how the brain functioning, the, the Kantian categories, basically. And obviously the later Nietzsche wants to do this, doesn't he? He says that physiology is the queen of the sciences and he wants to tra tra translate philosophy back into physiology. And, and this ties very much into what Kant wants to do with this problematic notion of purpose, right? Because without a biological notion of purpose, uh, what's your theory of the motivation to do philosophy, which is the essential task for Kant, the relation cognition to the ends of reason. You need a biological conception of purpose to achieve that. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, the thing is about him is that he's really on the side of like mechanism overall, and that he's he's in favor of um, a mechanical explanation of like physical phenomena. He's not trying to. Uh, he's trying. That's what he's kind of trying to preserve and protect from from teleology and from you know the over determination by the uh, subjective reason of uh, relationships. He's trying to insulate that. He's trying to create. That's what he's doing with you know creating the the possible experience and bounding it and kind of setting it apart and as the realm of the understanding, yeah. right? And making that its exclusive domain is that he's trying to protect that as a, a realm in which m uh, mechanical explanations are are applicable which they hold valid right so his point with teleology is that you know mechanism and teleology are are mutually exclusive and if you you need a teleological principle in order to treat these organisms and that's what allows you to hold them together in your mind and conceptualize them as these self-organizing self-directing things but once you try to go beyond that point of just accepting that as a need for uh, ex you know yeah. a mechanical explanation and once you try to start talking about like where does that come from why is it a self-organizing system and how does that work once you start getting into that problem is that you switch over metaphysically into a teleology then it has the possibility of then destroying all of the you know the mechanism that you've developed in your your explanation of the understanding yeah. Yeah, de definitely. Sorry, what, what Bateson also draws into the equation uh, in his theory of learning is as if um, thinking, which is the, you know the L's of in Kant, and uh, that that's like an, that's his version of analogy as a concept. Like uh, so, and probably like not recognizing as if thinking is that it's a fundamental error, is it? That that is the slippage into met back into metaphysics. So. Um, yeah, and and, and uh, the kind of as if thinking is really the key to what Kant's doing in the third critique. So you know, you have to use it's like to to get the teleology that you need to explore nature. You have to use your moral faculties, right? You have to almost anthropomorphize things to see them as end oriented in order that you can, uh, I mean, almost perform a post hoc derivation of what was the case. So it's it's tricky because Kant knows that he's proposing something that's metaphysical, but then he disciplines it. With a transcendental exposition to sort of keep reason within its bounds, and yeah, I think I think that's what von Neumann was trying to do as well. He saw um, economics as a dogmatic discipline, riddled with teleology and, and riddled with uh, these metaphorical slippages. And his theory of games was supposed to be a sort of prolegomena to economics, to be considered as a science. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then that's the whole thing that I found out. The more that I looked into it, is. Uh, you know, once you start getting into the more and more detail about it, is he was hired to be a, a consultant for a Rand Corporation, right? And they had famously sent him a letter or uh, uh, asked him that they just wanted the the time that he took to shave in the morning to consider some problems. And they they said something like, "You know, you're so smart, uh, John von Neumann. Is we you know don't want to take up your time, but for you this is this is nothing. You know, we just want you to shave in the morning and think about some of these stuff, uh, these problems, and you can tell us what you come up with, right? But he he uh, it took a very different direction from what he had wanted to do when he wrote the original paper with with Morgan Stern, right? Uh, it's it morphed from there and that the actual people who were working on the at, at Rand corporation who are all the operations research people and the Americans is that they had more they were more in tune with with uh, with Wiener in the sense that they weren't satisfied with the regulation and with the discipline that von Neumann had wanted to put games under right in the way that his model had worked in uh, its treatment of, of rationalities they wanted it you know to be perfect because von Neumann he's he's kind of a pessimist when it comes to human reason he's, he's is not saying in his game theory that this kind of reason actually exists or that people are rational I in this agree. sense yeah and he's you know, they weren't happy with that they wanted it to be rational for real in a like literal way so they try to kind of fix it yeah because it's an irony of history that game theory is then used to resurrect um you know homo economicus right and the rational agent the uh, it's only it takes yes. ages for them to, to you know to do that process of disciplining pure reason uh it you know with the con concepts of um bounded rationality with herbert simon and uh you know the kahneman and tversky work it takes it and <laughs> until eventually you need something like game stonks to happen and uh you realize that <laughs> consumers aren't rational but um 
Yeah, uh, it, it is interesting because von Neumann's like preferred group of economists, like what were was the Cal's Commission, which was very distinct from Austrianism, but also very distinct from the Chicago School, and they were effectively like market socialists who did want to institute like a pretty rigorous uh, planning regime, like they wanted to basically plan away uh, economic cycles because the economic cycles were seen as kind of like an expression of this like fundamental irrationality yeah. um but it, it makes me kind of curious because like there's not much writing that's done on the cows commission and most of what exists kind of it focuses on how like they kind of take up the walrus notion of like the auctioneer and you know they think that they can kind of like uh basically have a planner mimic market prices through kind of a trial and error method um, and I don't think that they ever really thought that they could reach optimization, but they could like approach optimization. So I'm trying to think of that in relation to like von Neumann's uh, kind of you know critique of like basically reifying models. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, it seems like there's a gulf there, but maybe not. Posing this more as a question than a you know a declaration. Yeah, I mean it's difficult, isn't it? Because the Austrians are probably the least teleological. I mean, when you're thinking plan yeah. planning, you are applying teleology to economics, right? But then the Austrians also were the least mathematical. I mean, Hayek was nowhere near as good a mathematician as Keynes, so I can see why von Neumann wouldn't be that interested uh, in ideological economics, you know, economics that has its own purpose in terms of influencing th policy. There's actually something, like, really uh, uh, interesting there, because, like, you know, Hayek wrote his, uh, ne like, neurology uh, Oh, book. yeah, the sensory order... Um, um, yeah, the sensory oh, order where, no, where I, I, don't, I haven't I haven't heard much about this book. Oh, uh, it's it's, you... like, it's wild. So so basically, the sensory or like um, so like if you go back to like the calculation debate, like Hayek talks about how um, you know, there's kind of like discrete knowledge that a planner could never learn, and that's because this knowledge is kind of like uh, very locally embedded in certain contexts. It, it's really an individualized form of knowledge. So like when an individual is confronted with an economic problem, they'll kind of like measure it against this resort reservoir of knowledge that they have amassed, you know, like past experiences that have built up. And so, you know, like you're wanting to do something economically, you're going to draw on your past experience. Um, and so that, that's his critique of like planned economies. But in the sensory order, he basically like extrapolates this to like how the brain works. And it's every individual kind of like the like uh, on a neural level, it's always kind of like uh, assessing problems that it encounters, you know, based on like these uh, patterns that have formed over time. Uh, it's it's really weird, but the thing is, is that he thought like he like said that like oh this is identical to what like von Neumann is doing like there's like letters and stuff where Hayek has said this, but then by Hayek's own um, admission, he did not understand the mathematics that von Neumann was doing. So it kind of like makes you ask, no. like, is it come on Hayek? Was it really the you, same? You, if he... Yeah, you can see how game theory plays into the theory in the sense that it's breaking it down to these from the global to these local interactions that then uh, build up to the neural level. Yeah, but but then I, I guess like Hayek is kind of doing, you know, he's de denying glo like the global perspective to the planner, but then he he does give it back to the pricing mechanism, right? Doesn't he? In terms of the the, catala the catalactic. Yes. Uh, uh, computational power of of uh, markets in action, where he, but he doesn't, you know, it, he's taking away like the, the the holism of the of the of that notion, but then he's kind of applying it wildly elsewhere to the functioning of markets. Yeah, because it kind of like scales up into a model of emergence, because you have every, all you know all the economic agents are evaluating you know their decisions based on past behavior. And then, like the price is just something that emerges like iteratively, and that's, you know, through this process. Yeah. This is actually something that's really interesting, though, in terms of debates with von Neumann and, and uh, cybernetics, is because in that kind of uh, the planning problem and, and Mises and Hayek and the way that they treat it is they treat the price as information, as right. yeah. yeah. And so I always, you know, that that's what allows the economy to optimize itself because the prices are all signals right and that tells everyone in the economy where all the resources need to go in order for an optimization to happen um mm -hmm. so that's that's one thing that uh, really interesting about but another another thing is with the way the uh von neumann is, is approaching the brain right and approaching uh you, you know that's the big debate between him and and, and viner is 
that they both are, you know, wanting to model the brain in terms of a computer. And really what von Neumann wants to do is he wants to create an overall yeah. theory of computation that includes the brain in it. But he doesn't necessarily think that the brain and a computer are, you know, collapsible into one another. But he wants to make a theory that can handle both. Yeah. Uh, Which this is kind of your critique of neo-rationalism, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. Well, I just think that, so, Wiener is obviously a kind of proponent of the earlier sort of symbolic logic version of, of building AI, right? Which you see amongst uh, Walter Gray and stuff as well, don't you? Where he thinks that you can just mm -hmm. add together all these, like, computational axioms and arrive at, like, a whole. Whereas von Neumann is really trying to break it down to these uh, yeah, iterations of, like, smaller agents. Uh, yeah, and it, it, it totally feeds into the... Um, the economic problem here as well but yeah so the, the i mean the extent to which you can apply computational theory to the theory of mind is is dealing with this problem as well because i mean like a complexity science approach to uh neural activity is going to say that it's basically simply this emergent property of like at scale of these of, of, of um of neuronal behavior in the small right but uh Mm -hmm. When you're when you're trying, and that's exactly yeah. That, oh, so I'm sorry, but that's exactly what von Neumann. That's what his problem with Weiner is, because I I, have, I found this letter um, that that von Neumann wrote to to Weiner about this exact thing, where you know he had kind of upset Weiner at a dinner when they were speaking, and he denied the possibility of making these models and, and developing exactly this this uh, you know computation theory of mind, right? And he 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 did, was very skeptical of it, and he kind of like pissed Weiner off because of it. So he wrote this kind of four or five page letter to Viner where he elaborates his thoughts and he starts out he's super he's very skeptical about it first of all uh, and he says that even though there's been some uh, you know it seems that Turing has been able to prove that this is possible that that just further complicates things because the, the real issue is you have to go on a much smaller scale and you can't just rely on uh, uh, overall kind of meta systems analogy that then you know you can't just apply that then to smaller scales as you have to start out at the small scale and his whole uh real worry is that you know the the t uh, scientific instruments and that the uh the methods in order to do stuff at such a small scale in terms of uh you know even mapping the the uh, n n uh, nerve connections of like a worm or something or whatever example he uses that that's like a huge problem that that might be impossible to do so he yeah, yeah it's, that's his point of skepticism about actually Which, making this you can see that hayek is doing a, a computational theory of mind because you know it, it, he basically draws a direct analogy he doesn't state it but it's very clear that he's making an analogy between how the market works and how the neural order of the brain works and so you have like kind of thoughts and decision patterns emerge from um these relays which is analogous to how price kind of emerges out of you know the catalactic of the market and so you know the, the market model that he has is explicitly computational so if the mind works analogously to how the the market works then his theory of mind is also uh computational by extension which yeah. makes it even you know more kind of curious the fact that he says that I'm doing what uh, von Neumann's doing when in reality he's doing something much closer to Wiener. I think so. Yeah. Um, I mean, philosophically, we're back at empiricism versus rationalism, right? Because you know, the, I mean, this interplay of like uh, minute phenomena is just the cascade of sensations in Hume, and uh, the top, you know, the bot that's the bottom up, and the top down view is really. Uh, scholastic, dogmatic, economically we can associate it with classical economics where it, it's operating with these uh, ideas of pure reason. It's, it's kind of like uncritically taking, you know, the economy, the rational economic agent. So, but it's difficult because I don't think you can't get anywhere with just the, uh, that empiricist approach, can you, of just um, uh, the sort of, you know, Conway games and iterations over things in terms of like understanding it yourself can you but maybe it is back to this idea of the kantian alzob and the as if judgment as to purposivity no that's a, that's a, exactly what i'm thinking too because i'm you can look at leibniz versus Locke about this uh and you can look at a lot of the problems that Locke has with uh the economics of his day 
and so one of the things that we've been looking at is his medalism, Locke's medalism, because we're concerned with this when the Bank of England is being formed in, in 1695, <laughs> and the way that all the it gets it gets virtualized, it's, it goes to all to paper and to credit, right? And before that, uh, you had all these different theories of. Uh, you know the the kind of mercantilists they're called uh but that's not really you know kind of that was the term mercantilist is actually made by the uh physiocrats actually in kind of the same way that neoconservative was made up by harrington you know ed in order yeah, to yeah. tar it's, it's the same thing where the physiocrats came up with the term mercantilist in order to, to uh kind of tar the 17th century early political economists because of the difference that they had in theories of value and because the older mercantilist you know, we're more uh, keen, you know, anxious to root everything, to ground all the value in, in something definite into land or, or something like that, or land or property, and or labor. And so uh, that's exactly the direction that economics went away from. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at Locke, uh, one of his big concerns with this new economy is that, you know, you need to have value uh, con you know, instantiated in something. You needed to have it rooted in something external. So you can't just, you know, detach it from objects. So he needs, like, he's a silver bug. He's like the original Ron Paul, actually. <laughs> I, that's, you know, for real. No. It's just like he, is he wants, uh, you know, the the value of silver to be a property of silver. And uh, I don't know why, but like gold bugs annoy the crap out of me, but I really, I have a fondness for silver bugs. <laughs> as long as it's silver. The underdog in the precious metal scene. <laughs> The basic principles underlying the free market, as Adam Smith taught them to his students in this university, are really very simple. Look at this lead pencil. There's not a single person in the world who can make this pencil. Remarkable statement? Not at all. The wood from which it's made, for all I know, comes from a tree that was cut down in the state of Washington. To cut down that tree, it took a saw. To make the saw, it took steel. To make the steel, it took iron ore. This black center, we call it lead, but it's really graphite, compressed graphite. I'm not sure where it comes from, but I think it comes from some mines in South America. This red top up here, the eraser, bit of rubber, probably comes from Malaya, where the rubber tree isn't even native. It was imported from South America by some businessmen with the help of the British government. This brass ferrule, I haven't the slightest idea where it came from. Or the yellow paint, or the paint that made the black lines, or the glue that holds it together. Literally thousands of people cooperated to make this pencil. People who don't speak the same language, who practice different religions, who might hate one another if they ever met. When you go down to the store and buy this pencil, you are in effect trading a few minutes of your time for a few seconds of the time of all those thousands of people. What brought them together and induced them to cooperate to make this pencil? There was no commissar sending out offices from, sending out orders from some central office. It was the magic of the price system, the impersonal operation of prices that brought them together, got them to cooperate to make this pencil so that you could have it for a trifling sum. That is why the operation of the free market is so essential, not only to promote productive efficiency, but even more to foster harmony and peace among the peoples of the world. But no, it's exactly it's, a, it's a fundamentally a cognitive problem, really, <laughs> that you're dealing with about where where are these uh, you know where is value located? Where are uh, all these different properties yes. located? Yeah, and, and and you know, like speculation, economic speculation is uh, an example of reason beyond its bounds in in the Kantian sense, right? It's like this, the patterning mechanism, Ooh. you know, sort of fritzing and producing more than it needs of things. And obviously, like, I mean, Kantian epistemology is directly related to the natural law tradition, right? The, the, the issues, the a priori and a, a posteriori, it actually goes back, I think, to natural law philosophers like von Grotius first. And when we're talking about, like, you know, the bounds, he is actually 
uh, relying on the, la- uh, the language of legal disputes over property and stuff, isn't he? I mean, the Kantian moment is kind of like the privatization of the soul. Like it, that, it's, it corresponds to that economically, I think, as well. In the sense that he's, you know, it's that sort of get off my land in terms of uh, <laughs> stating where, you know, this is, this is my eminence and that's transcendence, you know. Oh, and I, yeah, I'm, and absolutely. I'm wondering, you're, you're totally right. Uh, Thomas Murphy is that if you don't, if you're listening to this, is you have to know that this is exact is, is exactly what Khan is doing because he does use all these legal terms exactly. Is that, uh, you know, that's he his idea of something like subreption, which is uh, his big uh, his big error, his kind of rational fallacy of extending uh, categories like causality to uh, you know uh, rational ideas that you know, aren't part of the understanding. They're outside of. A possible experience right mm. that subreption is a legal term all these are legal terms that he's talking about he's a very yeah. legalistic he used the word trespass. To... <laughs> yeah exactly is that he is all about uh, each each faculty having its own domain of what it's you know has exclusive rights over Absolutely. and the same with the individual right in terms of of uh subjectivity yes and, and he, that's how sorry yeah he uses political so, metaphors he, he, as well doesn't yeah, he yeah, says, i'm sorry but it's all sorry. yeah it's the whole problem i mean that's the problem is it's inner subjectivity that he's he's concerned about that's the rationalistic problem that's the nihil the problem of nihilism is rationalism is it, it, you overextend it and you get to a point where every single subject is uh, overextending themselves into reality to a degree where all of a sudden uh, it problematizes the the idea of other minds and you start getting into subjects uh, overdetermining reality to the point where it's overwriting the minds of other people and uh, that's why the you know the critique of jacoby uh about infinite regress is exactly that that as that goes along it erases the autonomy and the independence of other minds so that's really what exactly what kant is doing is i mean but isn't this also what marx is doing as well like explicitly so when when he talks about like you know capital is an abstraction it's an abstraction that is in movement um and it quite literally takes over people's minds like i, I mentioned it like to you before kb yeah, but, yeah. like you can kind of totally read what Marx is saying with capital as, you know, it's a, not just a critique of political economy, but a continuation of the critique of metaphysics because um, i try, trying to think. It, it's a transcendental illusion. No, yeah, exactly. You know, uh, taking capital as a thing. Somebody just yesterday uh, p- posted something at me where they, they framed it in these terms of like capitals taking, you know, possessing people and placing all the emphasis on uh, capital. As doing all yeah. this stuff, but yeah. that's not really, you know, that's impossible. That doesn't make any sense. That's exactly yeah. what the transcendental illusion is. Yeah, because in Marx, capital is quite literally a social relation that's become reified. Yeah, and it's us. It's us who reify it. Exactly. It's, it's yeah. funny because, like, uh, but that Marx does use this. Like, he he extends the idea of capital as a subject while critiquing it as being an impossibility, right? But it's funny because in a lot of left critique mm-hmm. today, taking capital as the subject, as the agent, is. Uh, is what is what people do right but we know that that's not <laughs> that's that's extremely metaphysical but he does have this element of his analysis which is like there is capital as a scaled up like sort of pseudo transcendental subject yeah, yeah yeah i think he makes that explicit yeah. and I, I think that that actually plays directly into like what we're describing because in a way like he, he kind of identifies like the hegelian system with how capital itself you know operates and then stage as a critique of that system, kind of couched in economic terms. Yeah, though. definitely. That's yeah. why I understand him as anti-Hegelian. He's not a Hegelian at all. Is right. that his whole point is to critique that? Yeah, yeah. In, in the in the economic and philosophical manuscripts, the bits about Hegel near the end, he's very critical of Hegel. I, I'm always very confused when people try and like re-Hegelize him because obviously, yeah, it's got this Hegelian core, but he strips away so much, and the emphasis is always probably because of the way it's taught. But the emphasis is always on the Hegelian dimensions, not on the, the criticisms of of, of Hegel. But yeah, so I mean, Kant also like he doesn't he say that the faculty of reason is like the sedentary, right? It's like it is like the state form in itself. Whereas the the empirical is like uh, he say, he uses the word nomadic, anarchic, right? So the the, fac- yeah. the faculties at scale is, is is what we're talking about. And and I really think that Hegel in the philosophy of right kind of is trying to do this as well. He's trying to view the state. Uh, I mean, he talks about the building of the state, right? The state is a scaled up transcendental subject. And again, we're back to that problem with Hayek of like, you know, the activities of loads of minor sc- subjects scaling up into a major one. No, I think you're, you're absolutely correct about that because uh, 
first of all, reason in Kant is it's it's based around law. That reason is the faculty of law. The reason doesn't even have any content of its own to to deal with. Is that how that's how Kant builds up the faculties, right? Yeah. Is that first mm -hmm. of all the faculties are not constitutive. Is that he's not arguing with us or trying to imply that do you actually have a, a faculty of the understanding or a faculty of uh, reason that corresponds to a physical mechanism or a physiological mechanism in your brain? Is that he's just logically uh, categorizing the different functions of uh, consciousness, right? Is that he's saying that, you know, that these are the different operations that basically have to happen in order for consciousness to happen. And you know, th so he's that's how he's dividing it up. So with, with reason, he's, he, that's the highest point of abstraction. And so he has a whole thing just running through, you know, where you start off with, uh, you know, your senses basically taking from the manifold of all this uh, anarchic kind of um, sensory information, these impressions on you. It takes that, it binds these things together into intuitions, right? And then it um, subsumes those intuitions under uh, concepts of the understanding, right? In order to uh, create discursive uh, cognition of sensory information in an organized system mm. of concepts mm. and then by extending those concepts to a point and purifying them where there's no content where it's just the concept the relation. yeah yeah just the relation by abstracting that to uh the, its highest degree that then goes into reason but so reason is just dealing with relations purely and only is that there's no content or no objects in reason and so by just dealing with those relations it then becomes it's a faculty of law Exactly. So it's like in my, in terms of what you were just saying, T. Murph, is that that's its relation to the state in that way. You could say it's because you know it has it's a law giving and, and you know yeah. Which this is quite literally like what Deleuze and Guattari are doing in a thousand plateaus when they talk about the, the nomads and then state societies. And I think it's important because people tend to like kind of read it as like a purely anarchist text where people you know are supposed to identify with the nomads, but they. D and G never actually do that position. In no, the book. it's quite different. I think. No, it's, it's it's always both, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, it's both in the borderland. Yeah, the you guys really, you make, you guys make me want to read this for the first time. <laughs> Nobody ever has ever made me want to read that, but you do. But, yeah, seriously, there's no book that has worse readings of it. Oh yeah, the secondary you know, literature circulating awful, out there. But, um, yeah, no, it's it's really got that. I think it is a, a continuation of the terms Kant was using there as well. I mean, specifically, they say that. Uh, like striated space is idealist and smooth space is real, don't they? So they, they are certainly carrying on a transcendental yeah. analysis, which, you know, envelops the two of them. Um, and but, but that gets sort of taken away into a purely empirical one, I think, doesn't it? Just because I think they're using so many scientific concepts and so many sort of metaphors that it becomes quite it's unclear. Historical. But, um, uh, yeah. yeah. But, but yeah. So, but I mean, you know, it is in, in Kant, I think that's completely right, Kant, but the, the, uh, it's a tribunal of reason, right? Isn't it? It's it's legislative. It's it's negative in a way. It's it's a disciplining process. I mean, that, that's why Deleuze relates it to masochism in terms of like you're inflicting. You're, I, I yeah, was just you're inflicting. Say that, it's, it's, like... it's 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 a anti hubris mechanism. Like to proceed via pure reason is hubris, right? <laughs> and this is a, you know, it, it's um it's beyond its bounds of reason. So that the point the point of the of the critique uh, the critique is a, a tribunal of reason. And then hence, that's where all the legal language, the legal use comes from. Because basically, you know, the process is he'll start with a metaphysical exposition of something. So like in terms of space, you have the, uh, you know, the first axiom of the metaphysical, metaphysical exposition is like the sensorium day, right? It's like the natural ph ph philosopher's conception, the Newtonian conception of space is an infinitely extended ma given magnitude. And then he has to proceed using... Uh, more axioms to restrict this uh, it's exactly the same as the modern concept of restriction in set theory so um yeah oh that's interesting and and, and of course I, he yeah. uses architectural I really metaphors want to know well, more about the set. i think this tell me more about the set theory thomas murphy is that, that's why i really want to that's that's the whole point of it is because this is this is like what hilbert does right is that that's his foundationalism is, is to go through the set theory approach right yeah it's it's difficult to sort of totally map it but i i, I really think that Gödel's realization that they cannot be one axiomatic, right? When he's criticizing Whitehead and Russell's Principia, um, Principia, like it's basically moving on to this pluralist position, which I think resembles like a transcendental structure. I mean, Gödel's incompleteness theorem is used for all kinds of uh, nonsense within philosophy, so you have to be very careful here. But he does say, um, like, 
Yeah, Gödel says in 1964 that, first of all, the axioms of set theory by no means form a system closed in itself, but quite on the contrary, the very concept of set on which they are based suggests their extension by new axioms which, which asset the evidence of still further iterations of the operation set of, which is, your set of is what you use for the iterative uh, formulation of set theory, how to define a set, so you keep replying the set of function to itself. These axioms show clearly not only that the axiomatic system of set theory as used today is incomplete, but also that it can be supplemented without arbitrariness by new axioms which only unfold the content of the concept of set explained above. So, and, and, and now the kind, the, this idea of like a pluralist uh, conception of, of, of set theories or, or of a set is common, but I really think that basically what he's saying here is that like the choice of axioms in the formulation of set theory is exactly the same as what we're saying is going to be transcendental in transcendental philosophy. And they basically provide the boundaries of possible mathematical experience to use Kantian language. And um, so you can, you know, in certain formulations of set theory, certain things are possible and others aren't. And the perfect example would be Paul Cohen, who proved the independence of the continuum hypothesis, right? Which is strikingly similar to, um, uh, you know, the Kantian uh, mathematical antimonies about like you know the world has a beginning in time and is limited regarding in space or the world has no beginning and no limits in space it's really but he proves that this is undecidable and and you know undecidability will translate back into Kant speakers antinomic right so um what it's it seems like basically the there's not one axiomatic it can't achieve a complete totality in the sense of like a world whole in the Kantian sense we've been using but this kind of pluralism, and it's been linked also to the observer effect in physics. So I, I think that, yeah, the choice of axioms is something like the, the transcendental in, in Kant. And then with this, what we've been saying about the scaled up uh, state form, like Deleuze and Guattari use this idea of the axiomatic or the plurality of axiomatics to talk about the, the particular political economy of a given state, right? And um, what... Well What's funny? I mean, yeah. what's funny about it is that for, uh, if you don't know, is that in Kant, there's like, not a lot of the book actually has to do with reason, right? It's called the critique of pure reason, but the, just the general way that it's structured is that first it starts off with sense, the senses, right? It starts off with time and space and it's the, you know, and then it goes to the uh, logic. The transcendental logic and that whole section that has the metaphysical deduction and the transcendental deduction is that, that has to do with the understanding and then the the third and last part is the part that's actually about reason it's, that's the dialectic and so uh, that whole point of that part of the book is that he wants to derive essentially he first wants to critique uh you know transcendental illusion and the misapplication of, of reason uh, but then he also uh, wants to derive three what he calls pure ideas of, of reason and these are what regulates reason and these are th you know it's three highest ideals and it's it's the the first one is psychological it has to do with the 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 idea of an infinite subject or an absolute subject and the, the second one has to do with the cosmology it's like the absolute totality of everything in this in a system uh you know and then the third one is uh, disjunctive and it has to do with God it's the you know disjunctive idea of like the possibility space of like all of the everything that can exist basically and so the you know with these three ideas though what he's actually saying is that these are three things that are not in reason these these explicitly is that you know these are three that's what makes them regulative is that he's saying this is what is not in reason is these three things so you know in terms of what you were just the the Godel that you were reading off Thomas Murphy's like that's what it reminded me of is that you know it's it, you can go infinitely the more that you try to uh, you know derive from these axioms more axioms and that goes infinitely you get infinite infinite axioms but what Kant is saying with his transcendental argument is that well you can't it, the, these three things aren't in reason so that you will have exactly that same problem if you try to you know derive laws and reason uh, you know, through metaphysical uh, process of, of uh, you know, syllogistic um, kind of deduction, you will get the same problem of this infinite kind of multiplication of the, all these principles because you will never be able to find the, uh, the these three ideas within reason, right? No, and ideally they're kind of too big to ever become the concept, uh, ever become the content of sense, right? They're, they're sort of, and they're all the same thing. They're falsely derived unity, uh, unities of, you know, given topics as a system. 
So I, th I think it is the same sort of thing. But then we do need these ideas to orient ourselves, right? So we have to think about, of the whole of maths to find our place within it as an edifice, if you like. Or we need the idea of, like, it's like the paralogism of personality in Kant. Like, you need this idea of, like, there being a whole to your cognition. So, you know, to, to have the stability of the empirical ego. But we know that it's not really... It's not really there. That's like a formal relation it, we're imposing upon. Yeah, it. and his his it really his, his his fundamental point is that those these three ideas are then uh, you know kind of the engines in a way that make the three forms of uh, syllogistic reasoning work in terms of categorical, yeah. hypothetical, and disjunctive. Is that you know it, it, the way that he's saying that you get to these ideas is basically uh, you know he, by extending syllogistic chains. Right, and so with categorical syllogisms, is, and you're, you know, with you're dealing with, um, you know, sets, I guess, in a way, so you're dealing with, you know, categories of things. You know, uh, Socrates is part of the category of man. Man is part of the category of moral beings, and you you build up. So what he's saying is, you get to uh, the categorical idea through this uh, projection of the syllogistic chain uh, towards th its absolute end, where it gets to its most. Uh, you know, final object of the category that contains all other categories, but you know, also is not itself part of another category, right? Yeah. And so he's saying that you can never really get there. You can never get there, but he's saying that reason has uh, an ability to kind of infer uh, transcendentally its three categories without ever actually arriving at them. But you have you can only do that if you recognize that they're purely regulative, as a, you you can't get at them actually, or ever grasp them or gain knowledge of them. But you can use them to regulate your application of syllogistic reasoning. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, that's really taken up by the Romantics and of course Hegel and the idea of the absolute is something that you can approach, but you know, never quite get to close, but no cigar. It's like unendliche Ernährung in, or in Salomon Maimon, Immanen, which, which is, uh, you know, in, in, in mathematical terms, it's, it's the asymptotic function, right? It will never reach uh, the infinite, but it will uh, tend towards it. But this is exactly the problem of analogical reasoning and teleology, then, is that that's the error, is that they're doing exactly that of saying, oh, we'll get there eventually, or, you know, it's going to work itself out through history and realize itself, or, or things of that nature, is that that kind of argument is, is ex explicitly what, like, Kant is trying to break down to, and, and regulate. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but, I mean, this, yeah. you know, anytime we use an infinite series in mathematics, that's a problem, right? I mean, it, you know, in the iterative conception of set, you are, like, making that tend towards infinity, right, and applying a certain, in a certain, in the case of certain infinite sets. Um, I mean, the, the bigger problem is just the problem of the infinite, in, in terms of it being, like, you know, a possible but not actual uh, member in thought, but it being so useful in so many other ways as well. I mean, it feeds into the problem of, you know, the infinitesimal within the calculus like it's it's unreasonably effective but we can't like we can't justify the, the use of this crazy uh, object which we know like it, you know it can never like precisely that's it as you said it can never be completed it's um we can we can point to it as a process like oh so this category is going to contain everything that does x y and z and, and we'll start collecting those objects but i i mean maybe it's related to the halting problem and uh, and it's um Units of things that you, uh, are computable and things that aren't computable, like computational incitability. But uh, I'm not totally sure. I mean, Herman Cohen is trying to do this with sensibility, right? By taking the infinitesimal as the single unit that kind of builds up, that that's the core content of consciousness, right? Which builds up through these other patterning faculties to, uh, you know, forms. It's a kind of morphogenetic conception of cognition with that kind of bottom up approach that we said. But he abandons this, I think, according to the. The biases that's really yeah, there, at least know, in the this is also kind of like uh in Deleuze's difference in or yeah difference of repetition uh he draws on Lautman I think that's how it's pronounced but um you know he there's this whole idea of like uh, how are mathematical theories created and it's like the encounter you have like you know you're given amount of axioms and then you encounter like the mathematical problem, you know, capital P yeah. problem. And this like kind of generates a process in which, you know, you have to go and establish new mathematical theories and new axioms. And like Deleuze takes this model and, you know, kind of extends it. And he talks about, you know, the, the encounter with the problem is sets off this process that generates, you know, yeah. the concept. And so like philosophy is this continual creation of concepts because it's always kind of encountering problems. Yeah, but you, I wanted and, to point yeah. out the, the point that you made, Ed, about uh, uh, the singularity, right? You, you, I mean, you, you said that this was exactly what the singularity was the other day. 
Oh, the singularity is like basically if you take the um, you know so I'm using singularity in like the kind of the pop colloquial Silicon Valley term, but like in the way that they use it, it's basically the infinite extension of the analogy. Oh, definitely. You know, kind of o overriding all difference, and it's uh, analogy taken as basically like a, a religion because you basically reduce every system down to like this one singular model and then place it into you know an uh, you know apoc literally apocalyptic yeah, context. Yeah, definitely. And in terms of functional analysis, it's the same thing we were just talking about like i think one of the best formulations is by didier sornet the swiss uh, statistician it's like a finite time singularity is like when a process that you're taking um like is it looks like it's going to approach infinity and finite time which can't obviously can't be true so then you have to work out you know what's going on because it's it's taken to be like a signal of a, of a, a sea change or a, a phase transition you know because like I mean, right. I mean Andre Leroy Gohan does this the anthropologist in terms of the development of tools like he'll show that <laughs> there are stages in history where they get really good at making axe heads but axe heads can't possibly get like infinitely better so there's got to be some <laughs> uh uh, sta transitional stage at this point so yeah but where the axe becomes something yeah else. but then the, the problem is like you're saying it's like <laughs> what's your unit of analysis historically when you're talking about like this this function this single line you know it's um that's the real you know uh, you can take like an economic index which itself is like this artificial um you know pastiche of uh, various causal factors that are, I, I don't i don't know it's, it's it's a really difficult one to think about concretely i mean von neumann has that famous quote that sort of relates to it doesn't doesn't he he's basically saying that te technological progress must uh, ha like it is tending towards a uh, a meta system transition because of this a seemingly exponential but this growth, is exactly right? what ed Ed and wave your wave theory, Ed, but this because this is exactly the problem that we're having with this catastrophe fear theory, and then these, mm -hmm. the the economic cycle itself, right? Because it's exactly you know approaching these infinite points like by asymptote, right? It almost is, and then yeah. you know it it can't, and then that's what it, it collapses then, and that's where you get this the the uh, market cycle basically from. Yeah, because I I've kind of started thinking about yeah the the wave theory. Um, in, in terms of like you kind of have these uh, pre-programmed almost like economic behaviors that you know ideologically and historically derived but the the, the wave motion does kind of like come from the uh, clash between you know the the idealized market behavior as it's you know quote unquote supposed to function but then kind of like the the more you know real context in which this is embedded and the kind of the conflict between the two sets off this wave motion but it's very easy to like kind of you know reify and infinitely extend the wave you know also because it is a model yeah you have con con you have like contratif waves juggler yeah. waves Kuznet definitely waves. And you can break down waves into smaller waves can't you i mean it's like spectral decomposition you, you're you're yeah i mean you have, yeah you have nested sort of fractal waves and it's like it's the same way as like spectral decomposition works doesn't it by you break it down into the sum of a set of of sine waves yeah, yeah absolutely. It, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult problem that one uh, and and like um it's like i mean it's clearly directly related to marx's crisis theory well and like, and like when when Deleuze and Guattari are saying capitalism works by breaking down but the, and this kind of breaking down moment it is like when you know the axiomatic system reaches its point of saturation and then you know it counters a problem and has to you know go and reformulate again like it doesn't it fails to close and achieve its world whole it's um Yeah, which is, you know, in the, in the latter part of an economic wave, that's exactly the problem. Like, there's two sets of crises that happen in, in the, the probably the wave form that I think is most legit, where there's like a, a midpoint crisis. And this is what we could call like a crisis of regulation. And this is regulation understood in like a very broad sense, uh, kind of encompassing and going beyond, you know, quite literal economic regulation. But this has to do with like, you know, the way that institutions are structured, various forms of life and stuff like that. Um, so there, there's that crisis. But then at the end of the wave, there's a, you know, we can call it a crisis of accumulation, where you basically do have a mass saturation and decreasing returns start to happen. And so investment capital starts to become very idle and so yeah you do kind of have like dual breakdowns two different forms of breakdown that happen over the course of you know one quote-unquote wave um and yeah so that you know is 
kind of a, a learning process and does demand formation of like new innovations or openings of new markets. That's so, I, I love this stuff, man. I feel like this, we're, no, we're getting to the bottom of it all because the Austrians, right, is that's what they did when they were actually like in Austria, <laughs> that they did the, the business cycle research program. And so just trying to understand like, why does this, the process of the, of the market or capitalism or whatever you want to call it, why does that follow that pattern of boom and the bust and why does it accumulate towards these infinite asymptotes and then collapse and you you have a catastrophe you're really <laughs> dealing with almost the exactly the same thing as a, a consciousness in a kantian sense of, of of empirical consciousness where it's moments of of right. states of consciousness right which are conditioned within time along a timeline linearly and that's and, but mm -hmm. they're each one is divided by essentially an infinite amount of distance because it's just negative space between that's connecting all these things, right? It's just a moment and then a moment and then a moment. And there's essentially an infinite distance between each one. And so it creates like an illusion, essentially, of mm -hmm. consistency and coherence between all these moments that gets built up to mm. create the sense of, of having a singular consciousness. That's exactly, in my mind, what's happening with this, this market cycle is that you just have all this data on this line. And it's, you know, it's very illusionary and how we build up our sense of like oh there's an economy that's happening this is mat like this line describes the economy and really it's, it's like what is what is an economy though and that's i feel like that's what we're getting up in our political economy research with harrington and william petty this is what their political arithmetic is doing for the first time this is what thomas hobbes is like the leviathan and they're building up these national abstractions of these economic systems in order to create, yeah, in order to create these categories of yeah. the ma the macro economy, Which, or it, this is like a very interesting kind of approach into like the distinction between a lot of the, the Schumpeter style wave theories, which are the ones that I prefer, versus like the more classically Austrian. And the problem that they face is they kind of turn around on um, the question of endogenous and exogenous factors where the Austrians want to treat the central bank as m manipulating interest rates opening the economic cycle from that. And then they want to say that the central bank is an exogenous factor to the market. But if we go backwards in time, this whole like kind of liberal problem of, you know, uh, the national economy, there's the, the central bank, the Bank of England, they would never think of that as necessarily endogenous or exogenous. Like terms don't really strictly apply when you're talking about organizing a national scale marketplace. And so later debate, seems to be very muddled on those grounds and you consider you know the, the way that political and economic institutions like central banks which are thought more politically than economic how, how they're more interwoven on a on a fundamental level than most people would like to admit today yeah it's a lot of it's a, the mathematical tools that conceal that like today it's econometrics which does a lot of the heavy lifting about how you do this thomas murphy are you aware of the way that they do it in like price theory today if you look at any of the Chicago economists, Gary Becker, the way that they do it in price theory now, of how they build up the economy. Oh, it's uh, using the infinite series technique, isn't it? I, yeah, I think yeah. You, you told me that, though, I think, recently, yeah. That's exactly how they do that problem of political arithmetic, which this guy, William Petty, in a book that came out in 1690, that's exactly the same thing that he's doing, is that they're, they're just taking households and summing them together in this very kind of flat mathematical sense, like arithmetic, right? And that's what William Petty is doing. And then today, that's what Gary Becker does, but he just uses a sigma notation to do it like an infinite series. Yeah. I mean, we need to take this uh, theory back to Gilgamesh and Babylon, the birth of writing as well, don't we? With this sort of taking stock of Ooh. capital accumulation and primitive accumulation there. And of course, this wave thing has been identified by writers across history, right? There's obviously like Ibn Khaldun and the Mukaddima, one of the first works of sociology, and he talks about it. And actually, his model is is much better integrated than the modern ones in the sense that he talks that we'll now have to move between the economic and the cultural but he said it's all it's all there with decadence and economic booming and speculation and goes down and, and Gian Battista Vico obviously has a theory of right. history moving via cycles which is then taken up by Joyce and I think the, the Wall Street crash is on the first page of Finnegan's Wake so Finnegan's Wake can be read as an economic cycle as well. Marx was a pretty big reader of Vico as well, and you can find all kinds of weird cycles going off in some of his more far out writings. So I think that yeah. there's probably a, a very direct line there. Yeah, definitely. And Cantbot, like, I think that, I mean, Vico is often put along with Herder as being part of this skeptic tradition. And I like that idea of it being the Enlightenment as being this 
boom of positivism and then you get the the gnawing doubts of the skeptics like Herder and Vico and Haman creeping in. Enthusiasm is an interesting way to think about this. The moral panic as well. Enthusiasm in the classical philosophical sense of uh, the social implications of positivism. Oh yeah, I mean, and then enthusiasm it has a religious dimension. Yeah. And then that's how, Which, that's how it's that's used. That's in Hobbes. Yeah. That's the thing he, he dislikes the most, is the enthusiast. Yeah, and but that that's comes about in order to apply to kind of like uh, the Morvarians and the, the Piists and uh, the, the yeah. Methodists and, and these these new kinds of sects that come about. Yeah, it has like a very like uh, uh, religious. Well, I, what is heresy the proper term? Or are they regarded as heretics, but just kind of like this proliferation of like you know, yeah, divergent religious positions. Those the way that it comes about around around seventeen hundred is what enthusiasm comes to mean is it's an impolite form of, of christianity right is that because i thought heresy was kind of like too strong yeah it's some of it gets to the point where you do have sex that get so mystical right that you they just get weird and that's where you get into 18th century conspiracy theories about the masons and things like that and the, the diamond necklace affair at the court of uh you know louis the 16th and, and kind of you know the jesuits and things like that but for a lot of these the the issue is that they're trying to rationalize religion in in the mainstream of the enlightenment the state churches in the anglican church and in, in the lutheran church they're they're trying to rationalize it and take out the revelation right of saying that all these miracles happened and it's recorded in the bible and that those literal aspects of it that's what they kind of want to get away from and then there's all this movement to sublimate Christianity into this pure moral philosophy that's universal and ahistorical, it tends in this direction then of perennialism, right? Where they're trying to say that every world religion, that even the Muslims, that all of those are attempts to describe this universal moral philosophy, which is Christianity. And then they say that our version of it, the Christian version of it, that Jesus, he has the, the best version of it, or that he's the greatest moral teacher. I mean, that's just the direction that this polite kind of mainstream Christian theology goes in, in terms of establishment churches. But then you have the enthusiasts who are the ones who are most oppositional to that, who are trying to hold on to all these mystical tradi traditions, right? And that's the basis of what eventually becomes evangelicalism today that we know. And there is a connection there between those, but uh, you look at Georg Hamann is an example of this. If you look at him, obviously, his, his arguments about why this universal moral philosophy approach to christianity why that's so why it's all wrong is his critique of that is is much more sophisticated than you you can get from like a baptist in america today it's the same problem with uh, moving towards a global conception away from the local conception right and maybe losing sight of where the, the local origin yeah yeah and it's just it's the problem of abstraction and this is what really defines the whole tendency since descartes and since the 17th century it all has to do with the growing power of rational abstraction and the schism that happens within consciousness just a right? model <laughs> just pure abstract model that kind of subsumes everything into itself yeah it's it, it it's interesting because like we've talked a little bit about how these philosophers are misread descartes and leibniz which, and, and w one of these has historically been a, a strong separation between their mathematical approach and their philosophical approach right which is, it speaks to the same problem because obviously you know d d uh we don't relate descartes philosophy to his discovery of, of coordinate geometry but they are the same thing for him like he's talking about like you know basically the x-axis is like the res extensor and the y-axis is the res cogitans right and then in leibniz's use of algebra he says specifically he's saying that the, dif the differential is like the mind you know a, a body corresponds to the situation of a point or present state but souls correspond to the degree of change in the motion of the point so you know the body is this linear transit across the function and the soul is this you know uh, is it is the differential and like you were saying about it being a different level of abstraction but i i think that that sort of you know these individuals there was no there wasn't this disciplinary separation between their pursuits right and it's something that we've definitely lost today and i think that, that this problem about the disciplinary separation and the kind of over application of metaphors that are borrowed from other dis disciplines to grant you kind of like legitimacy in your own especially in economics like that's um part of the problem it's exactly the problem because you have all these connections then and that's how everything is getting built up since the 17th century and the construction of all these disciplines and I, is that they use these metaphorical bridges of analogical reasoning in order to get someplace else right in order to create this other thing and then as time has gone on 
we just swept away all those metaphors and, and the original underpinnings of them, and we just take things from here and there, and we clobber them all into a little system of science. It's like it doesn't really make any sense when you start to think about it. It all starts to unwind, and you realize that actually all this stuff is just castle in the sky of all these metaphors, which they've all been dispensed with. What is any of this even standing on at this point? Yeah. I think that an interesting approach is to generalize the Kantian moment, right? So to more concretely start this bleed between disciplines, what happens in Kant in terms of pure reason is the same thing as what happens in astronomy with Copernicus. It's the same thing as the crisis in tonality in 20th century music. It's the same thing as the crisis in foundations in 20th century mathematics. These disciplines become too arrogant, right? They try and ex overextend the applications of their concept, and then they're taken down a peg. There's this ungrounding moment. Freud called this uh, the great humiliations of man, didn't he? I mean, oh, sorry, Darwin was the other big one I forgot, who kind of shows that man is this contingent history, not rather than a benighted destiny. Freud calls these the great humiliations. I think he stole it from Dubois Raymond, actually. He you might know he was a sort of mechanist who was problematically inspired by Kant, really interesting figure, and he, he made the point originally. So th these are catastrophic moments, right? These are, like, these are like when the cycle starts to crash, if we're talking in those economic terms. Or like Laut Lautmann's idea of the problem. I think that Blizz is saying that it's the same as the Numenon. There's a transcendent element is introduced, which problematizes these disciplines, like the black swan in economics or whatever, like the coronavirus in the world economy. And, it's, and, it, and it, starts to, it starts to pull the... F which, this is the same in Toynbee. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And the ground is, is you know, it's gone from beneath your feet suddenly. Yeah, it's the, the challenge and then the internal development. Point B, it's like a civilization that he's... The civilization confronts some kind of immense challenge. And the way that it responds to it, it dictates the direction or maybe there's formations of new societies that kind of split from it. But it's kind of like a very, you know, question of like a internal development in response to this external force, which lose treats this as analogous to Lautmann's problem, or even when like Marx talks about humanity facing problems and, and solving them. Um, so it, it, it's very interesting how everybody's kind of circulating around the same conception of development. That's why I like Kant as an anti-philosopher. Yeah. Right? He's really just saying what you can't do with philosophy in a lot of sense. I mean, people, people don't like that reading, but I think it is best reading. He doesn't have this enthusiasm that Hegel has in terms of adding more and more concepts, more and more axioms. Like he's really trying to limit it so that you can pave the way for philosophy to be conceived as a science, because he was really nervous about obviously trying to make philosophy put it on the same level as, as, as physics. Yeah, and the, that's the crazy thing about it too, is that really because it's, it, Hegel is following Herder there, not Kant, and the way that he's treating these approach to history especially. But even if you look at the way that Hegel's building up his categories and his ontology, all of this, the, his yeah. whole system of it is exactly what Kant is trying to prevent. Because he's dealing with this problem of these multiplication of these categories, which is it's like hydra-headed, right, in the way that Hegel does it. But that's exactly what Kant is yeah. trying to head off. Is he's trying to say, well, actually, don't do that because it's a waste of your it's a waste of your time, and you run into this problem of grounding all these things, and it just leads to like what you don't realize it, it can go on infinitely. You're not going to complete the system of it, and so that's exactly Kant's point. And then I feel like that's exactly what Marx's rejection of Hegel is in his critique. That's one of the first things that he writes is his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. I mean, that's like a uh, no. That's our whole problem with is the way that economics is treating itself as this mathematical discipline that just is involved in the task of describing, and that's the conceit of all of these different sciences that we have today. Is they all rely on these these tacit, unspoken metaphors that we never investigate, that nobody is really delves into and breaks apart. They all rely on these metaphors in order to set themselves up as these purely descriptive enterprises, which claim to be sketching out or mapping or writing a scientific formula or designing a curve or describing a curve of what what is really in reality and these physical processes that really are happening and really they're just that's not what's happening at all they're not describing you know, anything it's that they're just right. it's all metaphorical the thing that they're trying to, to describe is always a metaphor that they're just drawing between themselves and another discipline so it's really that's the problem, the way that they're self-conceptualizing themselves, is they don't have a criticality, they don't, they're not critically aware of themselves, a critique sense of, of, of Kant or, or Marx or something like that. So that, I feel like that's what Marx explicitly, that's what he means by critique of political economy. He thinks capitalism is going to end itself and that there's a lot going on in terms of transitioning beyond that and the limitations of that, but he's also thinking of it in terms of a mindset or a worldview, right, that's running itself out. 
Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's capitalism. It, you know, he does have like that, like di dialectical apprehension, where like capitalism kind of has elements within itself, mainly on a technical level, that you know are out of joint with it. Like, like the development of machinery under capitalism basically does point to something beyond it, because the limited worldview of capitalism, like you know, really can't cope with its own kind of like developmental motor yeah and, and we're and, and um, we're enacting all this so like this is that's the whole point i feel is that uh, you know the, it's it seems like it is descriptive because it's providing these structural kind of diagrams or narrative models that we organize our behavior around socially because right. of the way that these fields are positing those models as scientific so it's like all very self-coordinating in a way that uh, creates the possibility of this illusion of it being real that we all kind of instill in it but that's the entire critique of like transcendental illusion or commodity fetishism right, right? yeah but i guess like the the one final like bit i wanted to add about that was that it does kind of get to this like infinity problem as well though because it, it one point like in, in his career like marx did think that like capitalism would kind of like self-terminate automatically and you would kind of you know you just develop the productive forces enough and you'll achieve socialism but i think he does ultimately end up breaking with this by the time he's you know working on like the grundrisse and the three volumes of capital and especially in capital volume three you kind of do get this idea of um like like an affinity problem like he he talks about like uh the the cycles of like um you know, uh, crisis and then like kind of reignition of economies, and he talks about it in terms of a vicious cycle. Yeah, but he uses he doesn't use the German term; he uses the French term for it. And the French term has a very kind of like preexistent negative connotation. You know, almost approaching something like how bad infinity works in Hegel, where it's just kind of like this eternal like loop. You know, you're kind of like stuck. You're lodged on the edge of you know this future but you'll never actually achieve it because like this kind of contradictory motion just kind of keeps imploding into itself and then reigniting definitely itself. yeah and, yes, and, and, i mean in, in capital three and in, in the uh the problem about the increase of constant capital in relation to variable capital variable capital is a bit like this finite time singularity isn't it where it's um yeah, that's exactly yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, and he says, that, I mean, it's doesn't like, he say, like, from a concrete point of view, accumulation resolves itself into the re reproduction of capital on a progressively increasing scale, circle in which simple reproduction moves, you know, like the business cycle, the economic cycle, alters its form, mm -hmm. and to use his, his Mondi's expression, changes into a spiral. Eine spirale. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was just about to say that he uses the, the term spiral when he's describing yeah. this process, and I can't see that as anything other than, yeah, like this kind of like regressing involution, but it never, you know, it. it never achieves that ultimate destination that it seems like it's trending yes. towards. Yes, yeah. That asymptotic approach again, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Which, we're on the verge of solving all this all this stuff. Our, our theories, like, are so powerful. We, we are, like, the tribunal of, of pure reason here, aren't we? Is I like, like that. I think so, too. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't I want to... I don't... I feel like, you, you know, I don't want to go for, for... Do a four-hour show or anything. I'm, I feel like we can kind of wrap it up here uh, for a nice little conversation to give people something yeah. to chew on maybe uh, you know well while, while we work on trying to develop this like 10 hour or, or whatever it's going to be <laughs> history political economy uh but i don't know i mean i i feel like these are very productive discussions because i yeah. I, I think the three of us should do this again because this was really delightful that would be great yeah i think that and then and I think next month too. I think we're going to be doing one with. Uh, uh, he's from Twitter. Uh, Tariq wants to do one too, so oh, yeah, cool. I think that will be one of the next one we do. But we, uh, you know, are working on our, our political economy one, uh, trying to finish that up as soon as possible. So that's what I'll probably be doing later today. But uh, you, you guys can chew on this conversation. Well that is uh, being prepared and i want to thank uh, thomas murphy for helping out so much with this we're not by no means done with this research so we're going to need your your help thomas murphy of course yeah happy to uh, we, we we, we got to go deeper into the into the math we you know? do yeah, yeah that's I, per, 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 yeah I, I'm an idiot when it comes. Like I am so bad at math, it's not even funny. So this is what mean you kept saying, uh, uh, like after we were reading for one day or or something about these mathematical problems. Just, then we we'd come back in the chat and just and say, 
Oh, uh, it's so great being a math genius now. Is it, I, yeah. Yeah. The, the problem is that, that <laughs> I gotta, there is so much fraudulent stuff out there in the economics world as well, though, isn't there? Like, if you pick up your average undergrad economics textbook, it's full of math, which is completely fraudulent and ideologically motivated. You know, it's right. diff it's very difficult to find you know techniques that make that make sense and can really help. You know, a, a lot of sort of financial mathematics is is there to sort of <laughs> hide the uh, fraudulence at the origin, as it were. Like. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like uh, of any like form of math or uh, economics, like the financial mathematics, I think is by far the most egregious. Like with uh, like if you look in like fields like innovation economics, people like Christopher Friedman, it's really very interesting because it's very critical of not just economics but of like the prevailing economic system, mm. and it's just completely contrary to what you find in like yeah finance uh, theory, which is just nothing but self-justification time series analysis yeah because that's really what that's that's really what they do at a, a higher level is they are involved in doing these linear regressions or non-linear regressions of economic data mm -hmm. you take all these stock prices or whatever uh you know there are mat or, or charted against time and then you regress that and you, you know you're looking for a correlation or a causative effect with some other group of data about you know some sociological metric that you have in, a, in a, another uh table right and you're just doing this regression to literally try to measure the degree to which one causes the other and it's like mathematically in terms of statistics you know that's you can mm -hmm. do that but you know when you're applying it to these social processes it's uh, you get to a huge problem in econometrics of like controlling for variables that you don't know, right? Mm. right. So they just have this huge black box kind of way to approach it where it's like, okay, we're going to control, quote unquote, control for all these variables that we don't even know that are also affecting this. And then mm -hmm. we, once we do that, we can say with scientific accuracy that, you know, uh, you know, that the, these, these, this, uh, this economic data that we have causes the stock price in this field to uh you know change by 60 percent or something it's like they try to get down to like the exact percent number that the cause the the uh, that it can be attributed to in terms of causation it's like when you're dealing with a whole sociological economic system that's actually holistic it's it doesn't really make a lot of sense to how you can separate out these factors like that does it i mean it never made sense to me when you know right and just to kind of like bring a lot of things kind of like full circle like uh econometrics were developed by the cows commission which were john von neumann's like people like his rand economists so it's literally <laughs> where it does come from and i mean that's actually why uh you know milton friedman and the chicago school why they start getting termed neoclass or uh yeah neoclassical in the like 80s and 90s is right because that's a new synthesis the point of that the usage there is to uh, describe what they see as a new synthesis of modern economic techniques for an analysis, mm -hmm. which include because you know, game theory was and, at Chicago, yeah, and that like the Milton Friedman and, and and crew they were really critical of cows, like because cows were basically market socialists and the you know nascent Chicago school were not, and so there was quite frequent debates between these two camps, and in the end, you know, it was like the Chicago school became the more kind of mainstream. And kind of like, you know, we don't really know about cows today, but they took cows' uh, econometric toolkit, yeah. you know, and it's like, we can apply this in a different context. Yeah, and then they added like game theory in and, and these other, then they, they created a new economic synthesis or consensus. And then that's what people, when we talk about in the neoclassical economics today, that's what they're talking about. But I don't know, I, we could go on literally forever. So I, we'll, I know. <laughs> we'll just say, we'll just say thank you, Thomas Murphy. It was a pleasant conversation. Thanks, Thomas, we could do it. No problem.